thinking about how to interpret that in different ways. And uh, we thought about exploring AR and VR and the lack of touch, but that seemed a bit boring. And then I was talking to a friend, Adnan, and he said, what about ceramics? Um, and I was like, what? Yes, of course. Um, so I got in touch with Stina, which I'm really excited to invite as today's speaker because when we talked about clay and ceramics and pottery, um, it brought about this interesting conversation about what it offers us as a way to connect with ourselves. And a lot of the things that uh, we discussed were these ideas that you often get bombarded of, you need to slow down, you need to be mindful, and the usual thing that everyone tells you is, do yoga. I don't enjoy yoga, sorry guys. Like I just generally don't enjoy yoga. Um, and so it was a lovely kind of conversation to think about ways to slow down and connect with ourselves and be more grounded um, in different ways. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Stina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'll try and regulate my voice a bit. <laughs> yes, please. So there's just an extra, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Stine uh, Dulong, and I'm a potter. I'm also the founder of Scandi Hulk's Pottery Studios. Um, we have three studios across uh, northeast London. You're going to have to excuse me. I'm so bad with tech, and um, I had actually forgotten how to use PowerPoint when I sat down to do this. <laughs> and I told a friend, and he said, it's my aspiration to forget how to <laughs> use PowerPoint. <laughs> So, um, yeah, bear with me if it all goes wrong. Um, but um, we run pottery classes from our studios in northeast London. I'm not sure it's working. <laughs> yeah? Do I just press the side button? Yeah? <laughs> Anyway, I'll keep going. Um, what I was going to show you here was some of my work, um, just so you get a feel for what kind of potter I am. Um, my story is that I wasn't always a potter. 10 years ago, I was a business crime lawyer in the city of London. Um, and also, there was a picture of me at a conference at RBS. I'm looking very corporate, and no doubt what I was talking about was really boring. Um, I'll try not to make the same mistake today. Uh, so outwardly back then, I was really successful. I was a corporate lawyer. I lived in Hampstead with my then fiance, who was a banker, <laughs> cliche. <laughs> um, you know, we went on exotic holidays and I had expensive handbags and all the things that we are told success is. But inside, I was like, oh, is this it? And I guess looking back, I was driven by a large, by this feeling of never being good enough. And that basically meant that I was always seeking this external validation. And that meant longer and longer hours in the office, sitting in front of the neon glow of my screen, bashing on a plastic keyboard. And during this period, <coughs> to keep myself sane, I had my weekends where I would go rock climbing, and I would go skiing, and I literally was hanging onto rocks for dear life um, at the weekends. And then one year I went skiing. We're on now, let's try. Oh, here we are, here am I in my studio. <laughs> Just flash through these. And then here's some of my work that I make. Um, and there I am at the conference. <laughs> so, um, I'm looking terrified actually. <laughs> A bit like how I'm feeling now. <laughs> Um, so anyway, one year I went skiing and um, I, it was perfect conditions. We were in Switzerland, me and my friends, and we were back of a glacier. And I don't know if there's any skiers here, but yeah, anyway, then you'll know that it's like it was powder snow and it was sunshine and it was beautiful. And my friend went down in front of me and made tracks in the snow. And I came after him and he was getting his camera out to take a picture of me. And then my ski hit some ice and I went flying forward, my binding didn't release, which basically meant that I was suspended midair in one leg, and my friends behind me heard my ligament snap. Uh, it was pretty bad, <laughs> and I face-palmed into the snow, I had snow down my neck, into my glove, everywhere. Um, I got back up, and my leg was literally just dangling under me. And my first thought, <gasps> how am I going to work? Uh, and not very well, it turned out. 
So um, I was on crutches in the end for nine months. Um, and you know, I was traveling to New York and I was going to client meetings, hobbling in and out on my crutches. And you know, I couldn't even carry my own luggage when I was on the red eye coming back from meetings and from Washington and New York. And yeah, basically I couldn't really perform in the same way that I had done before. And you know, I was literally forced to slow down. And then at work, what happened was that I got taken off all the good cases. Mm, my boss, I stopped being his favorite. And literally, my life outside of work as well was I couldn't climb, I couldn't run, I couldn't sail, I couldn't do anything. And so I suddenly had a lot of time um, at home, lying on my back, basically recovering both from the accident but also from the subsequent operations. And it gave me a lot of time to think about my life and how I'd been living it up until that point. And I realized that I'd spent so much of my life seeking this external validation, trying to achieve this idea of what I'd been told the success looked like. Um, and during my uh, knee rehab, I had to go to the gym super early in the morning because I had to be in the office for seven or eight o'clock. So that meant going to the gym before that. And um, I have to admit that I felt quite sorry for myself during this period, and life just felt a little bit hard. Um, but anyway, one morning I'm sitting in the gym and I'm pedaling on this exercise bike that I'm finally allowed to use, and it's slow motion without resistance. And then I look up on the screen, you know, I'm literally, I'm like on a metaphorical sort of road of self-pity, <laughs> pedaling down <laughs> it. <laughs> anyway, I look up on the screen, and on the screen there's the Paralympics. And then I had a little word with myself because I was like, my knee's going to be okay again. I'm going to be able to walk again. I'm going to be able to run again. Um, and I think that moment, it's like all my struggles and everything that I was going through actually just seemed quite minor. And also everything I'd been sort of striving for suddenly just felt quite pointless. And I realized also at this point, there was just like no way out. I could either keep stressing to achieve something that felt meaningless to me, or I could walk away from it all. And don't get me wrong, it was a terrifying moment to have this realization um, because I suppose everything I'd always worked towards up until this point in my life was being this successful, well-paid person. Um, so whilst I got off the crutches eventually, um, there was no way that I could walk back into my old way of being. And then six months later, I quit my job as a lawyer. I, yeah, woo! <laughs> um, but I actually had no idea. The story sometimes about me gets told that I quit to become a potter, but it's not the truth. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. Um, I was lucky and privileged that I had savings from my job, so um, I knew that if I was really, really, really careful, then I didn't have to work for about eight months to a year. Um, so, of course, that gave me this grace period um, that I was super lucky to have. Um, and I remember the day I handed in my notice at the law firm, I went to Lincoln's Inn to have my lunch, and I kicked my heels off into the grass, and I walked across the grass um, barefoot. And I think still to this day, that is one of my favorite <laughs> touch points. Um, and I can still recall that feeling, and I can recall the feeling because of the sense of freedom that I was starting to feel at this point in my life. Um, and also, uh, during my three-month notice, um, I wasn't doing a lot of overtime, <laughs> I have to admit. <laughs> there was none of that anymore. Um, so I suddenly had my evenings free to myself. And then one day, I went to a coffee shop, and I happened to stumble across a flyer for a pottery class. And I thought, why not? So I signed up. And then I went to my first class, and the teacher, um, who's still a friend of mine to this day, she placed this lump of clay in front of me, and she said, don't touch it, we need to wait for all the others to turn up. And I wasn't really thinking, and she turned her back, and then suddenly my fingers were on the clay, and I can still remember this sort of earthy, cool gentleness of the clay that I touched. And before I knew it, I'd stuck all 10 fingers <laughs> into the clay, <laughs> And God knows what I look like, because honestly, it's like this crazy woman standing there grinning with all 10 digits, <laughs> like, plugged into the clay. <laughs> and the teacher, she saw me, and she turned to her assistant, and she was like, oh, no, we've got another clay victim. <laughs> and, you know, that was it. It was literally 
love at first touch for me. Um, and then I joined a pottery studio and I spent as much time as I could making ceramics, which to be fair was a lot because I didn't have a job. Um, <laughs> and then eight months later, I'm you know um, still at the studio. My hair is like turning gray. This was actually taken the other evening after a class, but uh, <laughs> this is sort of what I started looking like. Covered in clay, like dust everywhere. I didn't have a single, like, cl my black clothes aren't really black anymore. That's just how it is. And I think at this point, they would have turned me away at the doors of the law firm <laughs> if I tried to get in. Um, but, you know, I also, the outward appearance just wasn't the only thing that was starting to change. I was slowing down. I was starting to appreciate all the little things in life, the little miracles, all the stuff that had always been there, but I'd just previously been too busy to notice. And these things included a smile from a passerby, the sun on my face on the bus in the morning, somebody picking up the papers I dropped in a shop, or even just making eye contact with the guy who made my coffee in the mornings. All of these things meant that <coughs> I was starting to connect both inward but also outward through the touch of clay. And people, like we with Al was just saying, people had previously to this always said to me, you should do yoga, you should do meditation, but none of that had felt comfortable or good for me. I am actually now a yogi, sorry, <laughs> all these years, 10 years later. But, um, but back then, it d just wasn't a comfortable place for me to be. But with clay, I could sit still and I could be with myself. And also I could be in a place in my body where it wasn't about achieving or the next thing I was going to prove externally. It just was, and I could just be. Um, so that was really magical. Um, I see here, that's me touching clay. <laughs> and that's just some lovely clay <laughs> to show you. Um, but saying all of this, my bank balance was slowly starting to cause me anxiety. So I started applying for jobs as a lawyer again. And I found one that would have been an excellent fit because it was part-time, meaning I could still play with clay. Um, and I went for the interview. I thought it went really well, perfect fit for the job. Um, and then they just never caught contact with me. And I was like, this is so weird. Anyway, so I called them up and I said, you know, I never heard from you. Have you got any feedback? And they said, you won't believe this, but they said, mm, we thought you were great, but we are not convinced that your heart is in it. And then, before I knew it, I heard myself say, no, you're right, my heart is not in it. <laughs> and that was the end of my glorious legal career. <laughs> there was no going back from that. <laughs> But, you know, my bank balance was still heading in the wrong direction, and I was still quite anxious about that. So I then um, decided to do a Christmas market that was put on by the pottery studio that I was at. Um, because I thought if I can at least just cover my costs, then I can justify this as a business and not just as a hobby. And then, um, I'll show you this picture. This is me all those years ago at my first market. And you can probably tell, I mean, I'm grinning, but I'm also feeling terrified. Uh, I felt like a fraud, and I didn't feel I was good enough to sell my work. Um, but then the universe smiled at me on this day, because the market, this is actually an actual picture from the market, um, it was super busy, and I sold out within an hour. And that was the moment for me, I was like, okay, I can do this. So then Scandi was turned into a business and not just a hobby. Um, and then I moved from the shared studio space into my own studio. There's a picture from that studio in the Beauvoir. Um, and then before I knew it, uh, chefs like Nigella Lawson and Tom Kerry started following me on Instagram. They started buying my plates and they started using them and I got commissioned by the Nobo Hotel and the Connaught Hotel. And, and all of these things were amazing and it fueled me on for a while, but then it got to a point where even that started feeling a little bit empty. And then I became more spiritual, I started yoga, um, and the more I connected in with the essence, I think, of why we're all here, the more I started to understand that it's like we are here in the world to be of service. And so, and that can sound really like a weird thing to say, but actually once you feel it and you start living it, then it makes a lot of sense. 
And I then started teaching classes because I realized that actually I'd been given this gift to share it, and that's what I do now. And also, I've been given this gift to share the healing that I got from working with clay. So that's my humble attempt in life now, is to do that. Um, there's a Wolfenstein studio, which we've tried to make like a little cozy clay sanctuary <laughs> with the green colors. Um, and then, so that means that these days the business has become something quite different. Um, here's some of the team uh, from our Christmas party this year. We're actually a team of 30 of us now. Um, we have three studios, um, as I've already said. And um, the greatest privilege of my life now is to see somebody else touch the clay and stick their digits in. <laughs> And it's now my job to turn to my assistant and go, oh no, <laughs> we've got another clay victim. Yeah. So that's my story. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Stina. <laughs> um, we will open up for questions uh, from the audience, but I'm actually quite curious. Um, what do you think is about clay that was so magnetic for you? Mm, I mean, I've I've been switched off, maybe it's about time. <laughs> um, I, I think it's earth, and I probably can't think of anything more grounding than earth to touch as a material. But I also think that there's something around the creative process in itself that is extremely healing, and the sort of flow state that we enter into when we do crafts and arts. Yeah, and I also, um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was listening to this, um, kind of person talk about this sense of touch as something that's very much something that we need all of us. And one of the things that we struggled with during the pandemic is the, sound, the lack of that. Mm -hmm. And that could be a very kind of sensual um, part that you get from your partner, from your family, but also could be fulfilled by a dog um, that you kind of get <coughs> the sense of touch yeah. from. Um, but clay offers that, I feel like, you know, in, a, in a very elemental way. Kind yeah, of. I agree. Yeah. I also think there's something around when you there's touch and the process of learning something new. Those two combined are magical. So, yeah. um, any questions, comments, thoughts from the audience? Yeah, I'll, I'll hold it. Especially coming from your background, um, how did you deal with imperfection and being comfortable with things not turning out exactly as you might have wished? Not very well. <laughs> um, that has been a process, and it is still a process for me, because I think um, the capitalist sort of society or world or machine that we are all having to operate within doesn't leave any room for imperfection, and it doesn't leave room for not immediately being perfect at something new. Um, and it's actually something I talk to my students a lot about, this sense of find this playfulness, the inner child, where it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to not be good at something immediately. Um, and I actually think that the more I've learned to let go, the happier I am. Um, and I think ceramics is literally one big lesson in learning to be okay with mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a very, if anyone here has that sort of tendency to want things to be perfect, I'd really recommend doing a craft where actually mistakes are encouraged or necessary to improve. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. <laughs> Here's your invitation to come and be imperfect. <laughs> There's actually a, um, a Japanese pottery tradition, or a tradition in the Japanese, it's not just pottery, but it's called wabi-sabi, and it's this idea that actually things are perfect because they're imperfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for your story today. And I feel, I think I heard like some people in the audience, including myself, we are now um, also in the same position that you were when you quit your job. Some of us lost our jobs and some maybe quit. And now we're in this state of looking for something new and maybe considering a change, a career change or not. How do you continue and not give up? Do you, do you have an advice how you dealt with it to go through this maybe several months of search? Mm, it's a good question. I don't think I have any magical answers. Um, and I also, f I'm quite careful with not 
trying to sell people this idea that there's like one thing out there that's going to fulfill us because I think that's just not true and you set people up for failure when you do that. But I think what for me it was all about, it was about continuing to try and do more of the things that were giving me a sense of meaning and fulfillment and joy. It's like I think we forget in this world that it's like we're allowed to have fun and, and it's like life doesn't have to be so serious all the time. And then it was sort of about balancing the joy with also building a business, I suppose, for me. Um, but I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think for me it was a lot about this. Th it's been just as much the inward journey as it was the outward one. So all those changes sort of happened parallel. But I'm also 10 years into the journey now, um, so maybe it's a bit hard for me sometimes to remember just how difficult it was at the time. I know I had nights where I woke up in the middle of the night going, <gasps> Oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> um, but to just maybe feel into your heart and trust that the direction you are heading is what feels good. Yeah. I also feel like it's one of those things that, w that it's not um, saying, hey, turn your hobby into a side hustle no. and make, it mm. make money from that. It's not, it's no. not that approach, which is so mm -hmm. toxic. And it's yeah, it really is, yeah. Um, yeah. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, in the chair. Hi. Hi. I've done quite a few of your courses, oh. and it's always such a pleasure. Uh, they're very imperfect, though, <laughs> <laughs> my, my works. <laughs> uh, you made it sound quite effortless, going from uh, something you do for pleasure to turning it into a business. And we all know here it's not that easy. <laughs> how did you go about that? Did you have a specific support system? How did you learn about how what you need to do to open the studios and hire people and make all that work? Um, it's a really good question, and no, of course it wasn't effortless. <laughs> uh, it's been a lot of hard work. Yeah, exactly, just sort of a wake up one day. <laughs> um, I think particularly the first two years of setting up Scandi Woods as a business was hard work, and I probably was working more than I had done previously in reality, but it didn't feel like work because I was doing it for myself, and it was something I was, I loved it. It was like, and so I think, um, one of the things maybe um, that was quite important in this process was that I made a business plan and I got a business mentor and she was really important in me changing this sort of thing into something that could make a profit. And I think also once we'd written it all down and I had it all in a business plan, it felt more like, oh yeah, it, this is actually possible, this is, this is doable. If I work hard and this is what I'm working hard towards, then I can make it work. Um, so I'd really recommend doing that. And, and mentors, oh my God, they're so important, both in my life and like my spiritual life and also in my professional life. Um, I couldn't be without gurus or mentors because that's how we grow. And, and so also that's when we are sort of pointed in the direction, I think, where there's still work to be done. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I hope that answers your question. Otherwise, come and talk to me after. And uh, yeah. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, that was lovely. I just want to ask you. a quick question. From when you realized your bank account was causing you anxiety to this particular point in time today, how long has that journey been? I missed the first bit, sorry. I think the mic caught out a little bit. Um, from the moment that your bank account was causing yeah. you anxiety till today, standing here, how long has that journey been? Ten years. Wow. I think that's useful to... Yeah, explain. no, yeah, 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 no, absolutely. <laughs> well, nine, nine years, but yeah, it, it's, it's been a long journey. And I, the first couple of years of Scandi, was I wasn't really, I was living hand to mouth. But there was actually also something very freeing in that. And of course, I was lucky. I didn't have any dependents at the time. And I, and I had this freedom to just do these things. And, and I guess also the privilege of having the background as a lawyer. So I sort of knew if everything goes completely wrong, I can always go back to being a paralegal or some sort of legal job, maybe at a lower salary. But there was that sort of safety net behind me. Yeah. And I think it's important that we recognize these privileges that we have also in this, because otherwise, it, as you're saying, it turns into this little toxic selling of a dream that it's like, oh, just do it, just quit. Like, but yeah, we also. Yeah, <coughs> Yeah, yeah, no, agreed. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. 
I feel like you've gone through an awakening and I think it's um, sometimes so difficult to be honest with yourself and truly know what you want from life. But um, how did your surroundings react? To, I mean, you've, you've come from a very different place. So I think it's not only difficult to convince yourself and, and stay true to yourself, but if you have family and friends saying, oh God, you're in trouble mm -hmm. or something, I'm, I can yeah. imagine that can be demotivating. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was really hard because, particularly in the beginning, everybody made me feel like I'd gone crazy. And apparently there was a rumor at the law firm, I mean, I understand it, but there was a rumor at the law firm that I'd had a breakdown and I couldn't handle it. And, and that was, but I also, I, I understand where that comes from because almost in that capitalist machine was like, the only way you would want out is if you can't handle it. There's no sort of, oh no, actually she made a conscious decision that this was killing her soul and she needed out. <laughs> you know, that doesn't really sort of sit so easy. <coughs> so I think that, and also, I mean, um, my parents didn't respond very well and my brother, I remember in particular, was very sort of like, you've worked all these years for all this, you're just gonna throw away your old life. And actually my answer at the time was, yes I am, because in order to create a new life, I need to get rid of the old one. And I think sometimes it's like, that killing off of old versions of ourselves is actually necessary, as brutal and as hard as it is. Um, Brené Brown, she says, um, she goes like, oh, it's my spiritual awakening or my breakdown, whichever, you know. <laughs> and I think there's probably, there are some overlaps there in terms of that, you know, the dismantling of the hardened lawyer scaffolding was painful, but it was necessary, right, yeah. <laughs> Any others? Any other questions, comments? Thank you for sharing your story. That was really beautiful. Um, so what's the vision for the next 10 years? It's a really good question <laughs> because actually the vision is just to continue as we are now and it's not going to get any bigger. It's a daily battle for me with my brain going, maybe we could make it a franchise. Maybe we could <laughs> open Scandihus Oxford. Maybe. And then I sit down now and this is actually something my spiritual guru has sort of taught me is to sit down with the question, why would I do this? And if the answer is to make more money, I don't do it. <laughs> and I think as it is now, the team is with 30 of us, and that's so big that I still know everybody, but I don't want it to get any bigger because then I'm just running a big business as well, and that's I have no interest in doing that. And I also think we can still give a personable experience, and I can ensure all our teachers give a similar sort of um, teaching experience. Um, and so yeah, so actually I don't really have any aspirations to do anything other than exactly what my life is now. And there's something really beautiful in that. It's, but I have to convince my brain <laughs> that that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. And one last one. Yeah, since you mentioned you're not planning to grow like um, the scale wise, have you considered like to teach, uh, to teach how to teach pottery? For example, because there is nothing worse that can happen to a newbie to get to a person who is not really like able to bring this love to the clay and to the... Uh, I, th I think the microphone is it's cutting out yeah. a little bit. I'm really struggling. I'm going to come closer. I, <laughs> I mean, like, have you considered to like starting to teach people how to teach pottery? Because ah. meeting the right teacher at the class is extremely important. And mm. if you or share the portrait, like the love to clay, how to make cups, bowls, plates, and you just no, can't do it properly. Mm. That's, that's what I actually noticed in my yoga studios, it teach the teachers how to teach yoga to make yeah. it not toxic. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good question too, and it's something I actually I think a lot about. and we recruit a certain type of teacher who's on the same page as me with pottery being predominantly for the healing effects. Of course, we teach you know how, how to make a cup and a plate and these things, but that's almost secondary. The primary thing for us is to create a safe space where people can come and be for two and a half hours, let go of all the worries and stress of everyday life and just sort of be. Um, so we do actually train our teachers quite a lot once they've been employed and they shadow all our other teachers as part of their training. Um, so I'm not sure if that was. Whether you also can help other people to, like to get this level of teaching, and they not necessarily actually work for you in the future, but they go to other studios mm -hmm. or they able to open their own studios. So it's not like you're expanding your 
uh, studios. You don't mm. need to create bigger business, but you actually enable people to start in their to mm. start their business. For example, in Oxford, open their own <laughs> studio. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, uh, sorry, I think I sort of indirectly actually already do this because a lot of our former students now either work with us or elsewhere. Um, so we sort of have got this thing where we take people under our wings. And, but it's, it's an interesting idea to maybe set up a sort of more uh, a teacher pottery school. Maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's nice. Thank you. And, you know, full circle, there are pottery course flyers on the, t on the <laughs> seats here, so maybe that will inspire yeah. someone. <laughs> but um, maybe to wrap up, um, I think Xavier might have mentioned kind of this uh, idea of having an, an awakening. I'm curious, what is the most common awakening that you witness in your students that are taking these courses and maybe sharing what we talked about uh, with Adam Kara? Oh, yeah. So I think... Um, we, when we spoke on the phone initially, I mentioned uh, John O'Donoghue, who's one of my favorite poets and um, theologists, and uh, he talks about how we are all from the clay, and essentially we are all these souls and clay bodies walking around on earth searching from the parts that we were split from. Anamkara means soul friend in, in Celtic, and uh, that's the concept. And I think for me, there was something that happened when I started working with clay, which was that I reconnected with a part of myself that had, got, that had been lost. And I think <coughs> then this reconnection with my hands and my brain and my heart, then suddenly it was like I was able to also connect outward. And that meant connecting with people around me in a way that I'd never been able to before. And I sort of previously had been super hyper independent and, and, and it was like everything softened into the clay. And then, the yeah. Was that what yes, you meant? Wonderful. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much, Stina. A round of applause for Stina. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Stina will hang around afterwards if anyone wants to chat and, and uh, ask more oh, questions.